introduction and thanks for joining this talk. Uh, I'm Masood, PhD student under supervision Eric Bayer, and today I want to speak about finite sample system identification of uh, EIV errors in variables systems using regression model. Uh, first, I even it in a motivation about uh, finite sample system identification, why it is important, and then I introduce a method for finite sample system identification and errors in variable systems will be summarized and we try to extend a method in finite sample system identification called sign perturb sums SPS for EIV systems using regression model and then I conclude what I said. Uh, as we all know system identification is a science of constructing mathematical model for a dynamical system based on observed data People these days call it uh, learning of dynamical systems or data-driven modeling, but yeah, its classical name is system identification. And generally, we have a we have an unknown data generating system, and it has inputs and outputs. And we have also unmeasured inputs, which generally we call them noise terms or disturbances. And we want to find a mathematical model for the unknown data generating system. Then the main procedure in system identification is first to select a model class, for example, a regression model or a state space representation. But probably it has several unknown parameters. We try to find those unknown parameters by the observed data. Okay, and uh, let me review uh, one method, one well-known method in system identification by a simple example. It's instrumental variable method. Uh, assume we have this simple data generating system, this linear and discrete, and a y of t is output and u of t is input. Easily, I mean, clearly y of t equals a naught, a coefficient multiplied by delayed, uh, delayed output plus b naught multiplied by delayed input plus noise term. And we measure input and output, and this noise term, n of t, is unknown for us. To identify or estimate this system, we select this model class and yeah, it has two unknown parameters, A and B. And in instrumental variable, we try to find A and B such that the empirical correlation between delayed inputs and prediction error equals zero. And by prediction error, I mean the mismatch between systems output and model output. Uh, it means that if there is correlation between this delayed input and prediction error, it means that there are more information in the data than what is expressed by the model and we need to change the parameters. Then by solving this, in this uh, specific simple case, it has a closed form solution. After finding this, we have a, a, an estimate, a point estimate. Now it's important to know the quality of this estimate. We want to find the quality tag for our model because it's important to know how far from we are the true parameter. If, uh, for, if we want to design a controller or if we want to predict something, it's important to know that quality. And generally people use asymptotic quality tags. I mean, they assume they have a, an infinite number of data points then by the uh, central limit theory and they say the distribution of the estimate that's that IV estimate is Gaussian with a specific covariance and then they try to find that covariance and that covariance can be a quality tag or it can be used to find confidence region and something like this. Although finite sample system identification in use, is useful in many situations and many applications, sometimes it's misleading because in practice we have a finite number of data points and this assumption can sometimes invalidate the result. We sometimes can find a very invalid quality tag. In response to that, a class of methods have been proposed, but just to show the importance of finite sample system identification and the sparsity of this research field, I want to quote from a paper uh, Writers on the, in the area of machine learning, all kind of outside of the system identification area, and they said that system identification is a core problem in dynamical systems. Um, 
has been which has been studied in depth for many years. Nevertheless, the list of non-synthetic results on identifying linear systems from noise data is surprisingly short. <clears throat> exactly in response to this uh, application and sparsity in this research field, a class of method called finite sample system identification methods have been proposed. And uh, to introduce these methods, first I want to give a very, very short literature review about it. In uh, 1942, uh, Fisher proposed a non-parametric test for difference between two means. We have two random variables, we have some observations, and we want to compare the mean. That method was non-synthetic and with minimal distributional assumption, which was very interesting. After, after that, uh, Hartigan uh, improved that work by using balanced, balanced set, which comes from the group theory. And he tried to find confidence regions, non-asymptotic confidence region for the mean of a random variable. Inspiring by these two works and also some methods, some randomized method, this class of methods, finite sample system identification methods, have been proposed. If you remember in instrument or variable, we input the data and we get an estimate, one single model. In finite sample system identification, we don't want to find one single model. The method delivers a model set. It means that we input the data and a probability, P, for example, and the method gives us a model set in a form of confidence region. And that confidence region has two important properties. First, it's uh, non-synthetic. I mean, it includes the true parameter with the user chosen probability in presence of a finite number of data points. For example, it's true for even 20 data points. And this non-synthetic result is valid under minimal distributional assumption, which I will explain in, in the next slides. And the second property is that uh, the confidence region shrinks around the true parameter as the number of data points goes to infinity. Two of those methods are leave out sign dominant correlation regions, LSSCR, and sign perturbed sums, SPS. Today, I want to focus on the newest one, SPS. Okay. Let me introduce the SPS approach with a, again, simple example. Assume we have, we measure data and we have n data points, input and output. This is our data generating system. Output equals V0 multiplied by delay input plus a noise. In SPS, we assume the noise is an independent sequence symmetrically distributed about zero. As you see, we don't fix the distribution. It just needs to be symmetric. It can be Gaussian, Laplacian, it includes a, a wide class of distributions. This is our model class and SPS aims to find a confidence interval, say theta, for B0 such that probability that B0 belongs to that interval equals 0.9. Uh, as, as you saw in the diagram, we input the data, we input this 0.9, which is the probability, and the SPS gives us the confidence interval. The steps are like this. In a, for a candidate B, first we need to compute prediction error, the mismatch between systems output and models output. In a second step, we compute nine random sign <coughs> sequences. Each sequence includes n elements. Capital N is the number of data points that we have, and we need to generate these random sequences, these random sign sequences. These are fair probability that each of them equals one and minus one equals 0.5. After that, we first compute S0 function. We can see S0 is a empirical correlation between delayed input and prediction error. Something similar to what we had in instrument or variable. Then we compute SI functions, which are perturbed version of S0 function. We compute them by using those random sign sequences and we, we perturb that empirical correlation and we find this I function. Then in total, we have 10 SI function from S0 to S9. Then the confidence interval, then the, that 90% interval 
will be the value is a p where s zero to the power of two is not the largest one among all the si functions to the power of two um actually two things are important in this algorithm first the intuition behind it why it works and why it gives us a confidence region which shrinks around the true parameter as the number of data points goes to infinity and the second thing is that why this method gives us a 90 percent exactly 90 percent confidence region okay to explain that intuition let me expand si functions here i expanded them Assume the situation that we are far from the true parameter. Means that, uh, it means that amplitude of B naught minus B is very large. B naught minus B is a large positive number or large negative number. We can see that in this case, S0 grows very fast because this term, the first term, is always positive or negative. Then it, the amplitude of S0 uh, grows very fast. We can ignore second term because it has noise and it noise is zero mean symmetrically distributed. But when we uh, observe this I function, we will see that the first term is not always positive or negative because we perturb it with a sign. That's why it gets, it gets positive, negative, positive, negative. And over summation, it doesn't grow so fast. That's why in a last step, we leave out those value of b for which s0 to the power of 2 is the largest one because it kind of indicates that we are far from the true value the second thing is that why actually this method is probabilistically granted this comes from this idea corresponding to the true value when b equals b naught it can be shown that all si function have the same probability distribution that's why there is no reason that s0 to the power of 2 should be higher than others. Or we can say that each si to the power of 2 has the same probability of being the largest, the second largest, the third largest, and the smallest. It, and its probability equals 1 over 10 because we have 10, uh, actually, si functions. By using this notion, we can prove the probability of confidence region and kind of by the number of random signs that we generate we can control the probability of confidence region okay let me show the method by this figure i plotted all si functions over b and uh, the blue the blue curve is s0 for example uh, we leave out one when b equals one we leave out this value because s0 has the largest value and most probably we are far from the true parameter and for example we keep 0.9 because s0 doesn't have the largest value okay. then in general case uh, sps i mean the formal representation for sps for a standard sps with instrumental variable is this we assume this data generating system and yeah y tilt is uh, output noise we assume that the output is corrupted by noise and yeah and the input and output noise are independent and as i said in this that example we assume the output noise as iid and symmetrically distributed about zero actually it shouldn't be iid it just needs to be independent and symmetrically distributed around zero and the standard sps use a regression regression model as you see the regressor includes delayed uh, outputs and delayed inputs and the approach is like this we first compute the prediction error and then we evaluate uh, SI functions. Just uh, there's one difference between this method and that example. In that example, we had only one parameter. Here, we can have more than one parameter. That's why we extend that vector. And we need to have as many as delayed input as we have unknown parameters. And yeah, and in this case, clearly, SI functions are vectors. Another thing is that. Uh, a new hyperparameter introduced, capital M, and we need to generate M minus one random signs. It's clear that this parameter can help us to control the probability of confidence region. Okay, after finding this, we need to, sorry, we need to find ZI functions. In the general case, SI functions are vectors. 
That's why we compute a norm of those vectors. Um, the confidence region consists of those value of theta for which Z0 is not among the Q largest value of all Zi functions. And again, Q is another hyperparameter. In that simple example, Q was equal to one, but generally we can say it's Q and yeah. It can be proved that uh, under the assumption that the noise is symmetrically distributed, probability that the confidence region contains the true parameter equals one minus Q over M. And as you saw in the algorithm, Q and M are user chosen parameters. Um, for example, in the sim that example, Q was equal to one and M was equal to 10. That's why we got a 90% confidence region. And then also it can be shown that uh, this confidence region is uh, asymptotically consistent. It means that uh, as the number of data points goes to infinity, it concentrates around the true parameter. That's the second theory. Okay, uh, <clears throat> this is SPS method, the standard SPS method. Let me introduce errors in variables system. In a standard system in system identification, uh, we generally assume that we have, we know the true input and the output is measured in noise. It's corrupted by noise. But errors in variables or EIV systems uh, are more general. In these systems, both input and output are contaminated by noise and we have only noise, noisy data. And we want to extend SPS to these data generating systems. Okay, and we want to find, again, confidence regions which are probabilistically guaranteed. Uh, these EIV systems have a lot of application, I think, in uh, image processing and especially fault detections. And these days, people tr sometimes try to find a single module in a network of dynamical systems, and then they try to model that module by EIV most of the times because they need to measure both input and output. Okay, but let me, let me explain why this, uh, why finding a probabilistically guaranteed confidence region for EIV systems is hard and kind of uh, the problems that we faced in extending SPS to EIV systems. The first problem is clearly because of uh, noise on input. Uh, assume this data generating system, this EIV data generating system, U not is true input, U tilt is noise on input and we observe U of T, the noise input. B naught, A naught are just polynomials based on backward shift operator. This is a simple uh, EIV data generating system. Okay, when we write the model for this system, we see that the output Y of T depends on true input and noise on output, clearly. Output doesn't depend on noise on input. Okay, but U naught, the true input is not available for us. Okay, that's why we rewrite the model, we add and subtract a term, and we rewrite it based on the observed signals, the observed data, and we call it the, the accumulated noise term WFT, and we get this system. Okay. Now, the model is based on the observed signal U of T, the noise input, but there is a problem. There is correlation between input and the noise because both of them depend on input noise. And that's why classical methods in system identification, for example, instrumental variable or least square, doesn't lead to an unbiased estimate. We get a biased estimate if we use a standard approaches. That's the first obstacle for extending PS2 EIV systems. The second one is about actually the nature of SPS. In finite sample system identification, we need to have this structure, this data generating system, when output is a function of true, uh, true parameters, input, noise terms, and a set of initial condition denoted by holographic R. I, 
And in SPS, we need to have a noise invertible structure in a sense that given true parameter and input and output and initial condition, we need to be able to recover the noise. Okay, this is the main part in all finite sample system identification methods. But here in errors in variable systems, we don't have a noise invertible structure because we have two noise terms and we cannot distinguish them. We cannot purely recover one of them. Okay, before explaining the method to solve these two problems and the solutions, I want to mention a related work that we did before. Uh, the first approach to solve this problem is to using a Kalman filter. We assume that all signals, I mean the input, the noise on input and noise on output are Gaussian. And by using the idea from joint output approach, we regarded both input and output as output. We come up with a state aspects representation and by using a Kalman filter, we constructed the confidence region. The method that I want to uh, present today is different from this because in the, this method, which we used a regression model, we tried to relax the Gaussian assumption. And also we tried to come up with a method with a lower, with a lower computational complexity. Okay, now let me explain the method that SPS for EIV using a regression model. This is the data generating system that we assumed, which is the EIV. Uh, again, B0, A0 are uh, back polynomials based on backward chip operator, and U0 is true input, U tilt is noise on input, and the available signal is U of T and Y of T, just noisy input and noisy output. We have uh, four assumptions for this data generating system. The first one just says that the upper bound for the degree of the polynomials are known. I mean, we know the order or an upper bound for the order. The second assumption is that true input and noise on input are mutually independent and II is zero in Gaussian random variables. <clears throat> this assumption can be relaxed and we can assume input and noise on input as uh, M independent sequences, but today I just focus on this, this case when they are IID Gaussian random variables. And then we assume that uh, true input and noise on input don't affect uh, output noise. Mathematically, they are independent. And, and the last assumption is that the inverse signal to noise ratio, I mean mu, the ratio between the variance of the noise on input to the variance of true input is known. This ratio kind of quantify the accuracy of the data because when it equals zero, it indicates that we observe input completely accurate. By assuming this data generating system, we tried to solve the mentioned problems. The first problem was about the bias in the estimate. To solve that problem, we used this alternative regression model. As you can see, the regressor includes delayed output and an estimate for input. You see that this is the least minimum min square estimate of true input given noise input. And to find that we use the that IS, uh, inverse signal to noise ratio. Okay, when we use this new regression model, this alternative regression model, it can be shown that the first problem about the bias will be solved. And corresponding to the true parameter, the prediction error and uh, the, in, the noisy input are independent. Then first problem will be disappeared. But still we have the second problem, the noise invertibility of the structure. Even if we use this regression model, we get this prediction error, which is combination of both noise terms and yeah, we cannot distinguish them. To solve this problem, we swapped the role of input and prediction error. In a standard SPS, we perturb prediction error. But here, we want to perturb input instead of prediction error because we face a, no a structure which is not noise inverted. Okay, by using these two trick, we proposed uh, this method. First, we compute prediction error 
to compute the prediction error, we need to use that new regressor model. And after that, we compute S0 function. Again, we need to have as many as delayed input in the vector as we have unknown parameters. And then we compute M minus one sign per turbo version of that S0 here. In the step three, we need to perturb input, as you can see here. We shouldn't perturb prediction error, we need to perturb input. That's why the signs appears in this vector. And then the other steps are the same. We compute the zi functions, which are a norm of si functions. And the competence region consists of those value of theta for which z0 is not among the q largest value of zi functions. Uh, it can be proved that this confidence region is probably under assumption one that I uh, mentioned uh, is probabilistically guaranteed. It means that it includes a true parameter with this probability Q and M are user chosen. Okay, it can be uh, changed by the user to control the probability of confidence region. And this result is non synthetic it's, it's true even for 10, for example, data points. And the probability of confidence region is exact. It means that it, the result is not conservative. If, if one wants a 90% confidence region, SPS gives exactly a 90% confidence region. <clears throat> okay, to prove the uh, asymptotic consistency of the method, we added some extra assumption. We assume the system is strictly stable and there is no zero pole cancellation in the system. And also we uh, added this assumption about uh, output noise. It, this, this inequality should hold with probability one for output noise. And under assumption one and two, it can be proved that for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists N of epsilon when the confidence region, the SPS confidence region will be included in the epsilon neighborhood of the two parameter for all number of data points bigger than n of epsilon. And this, this result is true with probability one for sure. And n of epsilon also depends on realization that we have, but I, uh, for simplicity, I didn't show it. Um, this theorem says that any parameter which doesn't correspond to the true value will be eventually excluded from the confidence region. And finally, we just sh shrink and concentrate around the true problem. Um, okay, now we find a confidence region uh, with the desired properties, but let's evaluate the shape of confidence region. Uh, what can we say about the shape of the confidence region? It can be proved that the confidence region for EIV system, the SPS confidence region for EIV system is a star com asymptotically a star complex with this star center, which is the IV estimate. And just I uh, um, review, remind you the star convexity, a, a region, a star convex region with a specific star center is a region that you can travel from center, from that star center, to all points in the region with a straight line, okay? And it can be shown that asymptotically we get a S star a convex region. This is important to us because uh, all S star convex regions are connected. It means th then it shows that the confidence region by SPS will be connected. And it motivates us to find an outer approximation, an ellipsoidal outer approximation for the SPS confidence region here. It's important because if you um, remember the, from the SPS, that um, simple example, we need to test all points in parameter space to understand if that point belongs to the confidence region or doesn't belong to the confidence region. It means that SPS actually suffers from the curse of dimension. If, if we can find an outer approximation for it, it remains probabilistically granted, and also it can be computed easily. The only thing is that when we find the outer approximation, the probability will not be exact. You know, we find a lower bound for the probability. Okay, to find that uh, outer approximation, that 
ellipsoidal outer approximation, I rewrite the um, uh, SPS confidence region like this. Remember, in the last step of SPS, we compare Z0 with ZI function, and based on the rank of Z0, we decided if that parameter belongs to the confidence region or if it doesn't belong to the confidence region. Okay. I rewrite it, it's Z0, and R of theta is the qth largest value of function Z. It can be shown that the SPS confidence region is this, this uh, region, but it's a little bit similar to an ellipsoid, but it's not ellipsoid for sure, because we have R of theta, which depends on theta. And to find that outer approximation, we replace R of theta with a parameter independent overbound R. And then this ellipsoid can be considered as an outer approximation. Now, the question is how to find that overbound R. I skip some details here, but it can be uh, shown that by solving this quadratic program, we can find the value for, uh, value for that R, that overbound value. And this quadratic program, uh, I just should mention that the coefficients that we have and the matrices that we have in the constraint depends on those random signs. Okay, still we find an outer approximation, but still it's, uh, it's not deterministic, it's probabilistic. Uh, okay, this, there was the, that quadratic program was not convex, but was trying convex the holes, and by solving the dual program, we can find the value for R. But uh, again, the parameters and ma matrices and vectors that we have depends on that random sign. That's why we need to solve this dual program m minus one times, similar to what we had in SPS. We computed m minus one perturbed version of S0. Here also we need to uh, solve it m minus one times, and R will be Qth largest result that we get from this dual program. And then this will be the, that outer approximation. We compute uh, theta of IV and we solve the dual program, as I said, n minus one times, and the R be the Qth largest gamma value. And this will be the outer approximation. Uh, again, it's probabilistically guaranteed and it's uh, stochastic. And again, we can uh, control the probability of this outer approximation. Uh, okay, let me uh, show what I said with a simple example. Assume this data generating system. Uh, to remember assumption one, we had some assumption about, uh, about the distribution of input and noise on input, but we haven't had any assumption about output noise. Actually, in this method, output noise can be anything can be a correlated sequence, which is not even zero mean. That's why in this example, uh, which is an ERV, I assume that the output noise is a correlated Laplacian noise with mean 0.5. It's not even zero. Okay, to apply SPS, we first compute prediction error. I used that uh, regressor model, uh, including the estimate of true input, that the 1.2 ratio, is computed using that inverse signal to noise ratio. We compute prediction error, then S0 function. Here we have two unknown parameters, A and B, in this data generating system. That's why I used U of T minus one and U of T minus two. And then we compute SI functions and we perturb input here to find the SI functions. And then we compute Z0, ZI functions, all ZI functions. To show that the probability of this confidence region is exactly uh, true, similar to the theorem that which was proved, uh, I assumed that Q equals 10 and M equals to 100 means that SPS should give me a 90% confidence region. I repeated the experiment 10 to the power of five times and I computed the empirical probability. It's clear that the empirical probability will be very close to the actual value, that the value that we expected from the theory. 
And another thing is to actually evaluate that outer approximation and also the convergence of their confidence regions by uh, with 250 and 1000 and 4000 data points i uh, constructed that confidence region it's again a 90 percent confidence region m equals to 100 and q equals to 10 and the the that solid line is the original SPS confidence region and dash line is the outer approximation and we will see that by the grid line we will see that the as the number of data points increases the confidence region gets smaller and smaller and concentrates around the true prompt uh, okay uh, conclude what I said I proposed a non-asymptotic confidence region for EIV systems using this time using a regression model. And uh, this is probabilistically guaranteed. I mean, it includes the two parameter with the exact probability. Uh, and it concentrates around the true parameter. And finally, we can say any parameter doesn't correspond to the true value will be excluded from the confidence region as the number of data points goes to infinity. And in this approach, we don't have any assumption about output noise. Now, output noise can be correlated and can be zero mean can be non-zero means, sorry. Uh, thanks for your attention. Yeah. Okay, That's thanks. thanks. Thanks, Masood. If there is any question for Masood, please raise your hands or send it in the chat. Okay. No, Igor, yep. Uh, sorry. Uh, just if you allow me, uh, just sorry if I misunderstood anything, but I find it strange a bit that you mentioned that there are no assumptions uh, on the noise. Okay, and uh, on one of the first uh, slides, well, actually, um, uh, it was assumed that NT is um, a sequence of independent uh, random variables uh, with symmetric probability. Yeah. A distribution and uh, so are they identically distributed uh, or uh, and uh, or do you assume that for example they have uh, uh, finite moments well for example does it include the Cauchy distribution uh, okay and also I have a couple of more questions uh, well uh, well speaking about the central limit theorem you know when you uh, when one estimates uh, the coefficient a uh, in an autoregressive type a dynamic model uh, then uh, it is not just a central limit theorem in, in that case one deals with uh, a more complicated object and uh, uh, th that result on asymptotic normality uh, for the deviation yeah. from the true value of the parameter it is not just uh, a consequence of the classical uh, central limit theorem yeah. uh, so and the theory in that case is more complicated and just uh w w well the last remark before uh you respond uh is uh, that um well you say for example if uh if if you consider you know one of the first equations uh, uh which is organized as y t equals uh, a times y t minus one plus b u t minus one plus yes uh, plus nt, okay, uh, then in, th in that case, for example, one can consider uh, a Bayesian approach when, uh, well, at least in the case when nt is uh, a discrete time Gaussian white noise and, uh, and, the other, and the parameters a, b, you know, are endowed with a prior uh, Gaussian distribution. In that case, it is possible uh, to actually recursively compute the posterior uh, or conditional uh, probability a distribution for the pair of for the pair of parameters a b and that posterior uh, uh, probability a distribution is going to be gaussian or well, more precisely conditional gaussian so in that case the problem of um, finding uh, a confidence interval or or an ellipsoid in this uh, two parameter case uh, will becomes uh, fairly trivial okay so that's all that uh, i wanted to point out yeah 
Yeah, you are right. Um, actually, for the first one that I said, the noise is not uh, zero mean. Um, yeah, yeah, it looks a little bit strange, but uh, considering this fact that we have some uh, restrictive assumption on input, I think it's logical. I think, for example, a simple, uh, a simple instrument or variable gives us a, a unbiased, uh, unbiased estimate for, for this case as well. I mean, a simple instrument or variable choosing a proper instrument can give us uh, unbiased when we have a when we have a correlated non-zero mean noise to the best of my knowledge. And for that asymptotic theory, yeah, you are right. There are a lot of assumptions, especially I think we need to model the inputs. Uh, we consider them as a ARMA processes, something like this. And also, I think moment moment uh, three plus epsilon for uh, epsilon should be bounded. Uh, there are a lot of assumptions. You are right. I ignored them here. Yes. Mm. And for the Bayesian, I think uh, actually it's a very interesting question. Uh, this in in this setup, in the setup of finite sample system identification, the creator assumed that the unknown they are kind of have a frequentist idea. They assume that the unknown parameter is, doesn't have any distribution. It's fixed, yeah, and it's unknown. And then they claim that we want data to speak about the distribution. Yeah, you are right, in the Bayesian method, which is very well known and common, we, 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 use, we can, for example, solve the problem for that simple example very fast and very easy. Um, but we need to have a prior. We need to somehow have a prior knowledge. And I think the prior knowledge here is minimal. We just say the distribution is symmetric. I think in comparison with Bayesian, although maybe there are several pros and cons about these two approaches, but I think the main issue is that we don't have any prior and we let data speak about itself. That's it. Uh, Masu, there is a question for you in the chat related to what you just answered. Uh, I think the uh, the intuition uh, actually for for uh, for asymptotic convergence for those results. We need to have some uh, some assumptions, as I as I showed, an inequality to hold. The, for sure, that for example, the output noise shouldn't go to infinity very fast, something like this. But I think uh, the intuition maybe is that we have an input which is zero mean and Gaussian. We have a noise on input which again zero mean and Gaussian. We know this fact. Then any artifact, any non-zero mean value can be considered as output noise, and we shouldn't be worried about it. I think the main intuition is this. Yeah, uh, there are a, a lot of discussion about this. You are right. For example, if Q equals 10 in the SPS, uh, if Q equals 10, and M equals 100, we get a 90% confidence region. And again, if Q equals one and M equals 10, again, we get a same, uh, same probability confidence region. Um, the SPS gives us a probabilistic confidence region. It means that for, for a specific data, if we run the SPS two times, we get two different confidence regions. It's completely deterministic. When we choose large value for Q and M, it's, it's clear that the computation, computational complexity will be higher, but it kind of gets a little bit robust. It means that if we run the program two times, it doesn't change a lot because we decide based on a lot of sequences, a lot of random sign sequences. But if it's a small, for example, Q equals one and M equals 10, again, it's probabilistically guaranteed for sure, but, uh, it will not be robust, and if you run the program two times, it will be different yeah, each, each time. The confidence gen will be completely different. The thing, I mean, the, 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 the issue is that that probability that we show, I mean, we say the probability that the pro true parameter belongs to the confidence region, the probability is with, with respect to the noise in the data and the randomization in the method, not just the noise in the data. It's not, for example, a method like maximum likelihood or something like this. We have randomized in 
method and the probability is also with respect to that randomization. Okay. If there is no other question, we can ask Masood again. Thank you. Thanks, Masood. And Thank see, you. see everyone next week for our next talk. Thank you. Thank you.